Okay, perfect. I'm in. Okay. So share the content on chromatography part A. Just takes a little bit of time to sometimes to reset. There we go. So do you guys see that tunnel? Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll take that stop sharing and I'll get rid of it down over to here. So it's not in the middle of everything. I do mine by slideshows without uh, the sidebar. So slideshow from beginning. All right, so you should have a full screen now of my presentation. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, process chromatography part A. It's ILM 310404AA. My version that I have that I'm working on off of this is version 22. I understand that there has been some versions that are 23. Uh, the ones that have got 21s or things like that or, or lower ones, it's all going to fit. The page number might be off a little bit, but the information is, is pretty much the same. So our learning objectives here. The first one is explain the principle of analysis utilized by chromatography. Uh, define terminology used in chromo uh, chromatography. It looks like describe the components of gas chromatography. And that's really what we're doing today is on this one is the gas chromatography. Um, the, the part B is a liquid, but we'll talk a little bit about each in this uh, ILM also. And describe the detectors using gas chromatography. So um, these detectors will be uh, right at the end of the, uh, of the ILM, and it'll, it'll just basically show you how um, they figure out uh, how much gas is in there and usually a millivolt or a milliamp signal. So the learning objective one, explain the principles of analysis utilized in chromatography. And a couple definitions here, a homogeneous mixture, it's uh, all its components, whatever it is, whether it be gas or water, or um, all of its components are evenly distributed through the mixture. This is important because uh, um, the, um, chromatography, the, the chromatograph will measure that and will will if everything's even then when you're putting your sample through um, the analyzer you're going to actually um, it's going to actually separate all the components and you need a homogeneous mixture to do that secondly composition includes the names and concentrations of each component in that mixture what is in that mixture and the, and the composition qualitative analysis is what we'll be doing so it identifies, qualitative, identifies what's in the compound. Um, this is the quality of the compound, like this, say something like natural gas, most of it's methane, but there's all lots of these off gases. But qualitative analysis identifies the types of compounds. The next analysis we'll do is quantitative. So now we know what's in there, well, how much of all of this stuff is going to be in there. So that would be my quantitative analysis. So when I look at this, and I don't know if you guys ever did any chemistry uh, in high school or whatever, but in this case here, chromat uh, chromatography is a technique that separates mixtures into the components and obtains the data. So my mixture here, and if you can see that on the left-hand side, and I have a big arrow here, you can see that that the mixture is plant pigments, and it's there's three different plant pigments are in the mixture there. Um, that isn't homogeneous. Uh, if you look at it, it's um, but it's I guess it's the way they they describe that uh, through this uh, figure. But we've got yellow, orange, and green, and that whole thing should be a brown. Um, but anyway, so what we need um, we need two different phases to separate these things. One's called a stationary phase, and that's the the solid or the chalk that's inside that gray matter. It's stationary; it doesn't move. Then we need something to flush through the mixture, and that's called and that's called um, the mobile phase. And what we're doing here is we're looking at a liquid solvent, and liquid solvent could be could be water 
Um, water is the number one solvent of, of the earth, but it could be anything depending on what you're actually trying to separate. In gas uh, chromatography, the mobile phase is a gas and the stationary phase is either liquid or a solid. So with gas chromatography, the gas is the um, mobile phase. That's what's pushing all your sample through the, uh, the chromatograph or the analyzer. <clears throat> so if we look at this here, um, uh, and, and, and the tubing that we use and, and down in the gas chromatograph down in the lab, it's one eighth tubing OD. So it's very tiny, tiny, tiny tubing. Um, if I look at step one here, uh, this is where my mobile gas. So that's that's going to be my gas is pushing it through the analyzer. This here is my mixture. And what's happening is as the mobile gas pushes the mixture through this tubing, um, that is the mobile phase. The stationary phase is is um, bonded to the inside of this tubing. In this case, it's a liquid liquid stationary phase. So this tubing is is completely bonded on the inside with um, a liquid stationary phase. Now what happens is you have absorption of some of the of the components. So in this case here, this is absorption. Uh, my black will call that X absorbs into the liquid stationary phase and then my component y continues on through if you look at step two uh all of all of x is absorbed and y continues to go and the reason that is because of uh, and we'll get into this a little later in the in the um in the lecture um it's the affinity of the liquid and the guy and and the component if it has a high affinity, it's going to attach to it. If it has a low affinity, it's not going to. And that's how we get this uh, uh, component Y going through. So once once uh, once we have finished step two, uh, this gas is this this component is going through. Uh, we, then we have elution. Elution is when it it leaves this, uh, the liquid stationary phase because the mobile gas is pushing it through. Um, uh, Y has already gone through, and then it comes through, and then this will push it to the detector. Each one of these steps is pushing through the column to the detector. So in this case here, uh, this is the column, and the column is uh, is uh, what holds the, uh, the the basically the stationary phase. Um, right here is my mixture of X and Y. The mobile gas is pushing through here and it pushes to a detector. And then the detector uh, go, uh, goes to a controller which produces a chromatograph. And this detector uh, is in millivolts and millivolts is on your vertical. And the time it takes for that part of the component to come out is time and it's retention time here. So that's, on, that's when we first start it. And that's like an injection point. Detectors generate an electrical signal of either millivolts or milliamps. So in this case here, uh, X went right through and it's inside my detector already and Y is still here. So when uh, the detector detects the X component, it gives a little peak. And that's how long it takes to get there. So the time from here to here is retention time. Uh, it, it has a peak and comes back down when it goes through. And then the next one is going to be in C is your Y. Now your Y component is through and I have two peaks. So a plot of the detector output on a vertical axis and time on the bottom axis. So that detector output is in millivolts in this case, and the bottom axis is in time. So here we have our X and our Y. Uh, right here was the sample injection point, right? And of course we have zero millivolts coming out from the detector. As soon as, uh, well, this is 80 seconds uh, from my uh, sample injection point to 80 seconds. That is gonna be the peak, right? That's going to be the top point of the highest point of the peak. And that's going to be, in this case, it was 80 seconds. Y came out in 220 seconds. 
And so this time in here between 80 and 220 seconds is my retention time, TR. And you'll be seeing that, lots of that. These are compared to a known standard uh, uh, chromatograph performed in a laboratory. So um, what happens is uh, pure, any, anything that's like that we're going to analyze, we would um, have a known chromatograph that has been performed in a laboratory to compare to these, the ones that we're doing. So we can, we can tell through that, that it's a compared um, standard and it's performed in a laboratory. Okay, so here we go again. We've got retention time in seconds. Peak area is determined is to determine the concentration. So what the concentration, how it's determined is all this area within this peak. So in this case, pentane come through, it came through at 80. So this is how much of the pentane I have is the area of the peak. So all the area that's underneath this is going to be the uh, uh, composition or the or the um, concentration of pentane. Here, the same thing with with hexane. Uh, I've got also whatever's underneath the area of this peak. We are going to have the concentration of methane or hexane. Sorry. Now, one of the things that happens on, on these analyzers is that depending on what we're using for our, our, um, our stationary phase, it has affinity. In other words, it, it responds better to some chemicals than others. So it may draw in the chemical further, it may keep it longer, all this kind of stuff. So this statement here, it says, because areas are larger, it doesn't mean that there's a larger amount of that component. The response of the detector could be stronger for that component. So there's a way to calculate that, and I'm going to show you that uh, um, in the next couple slides. So in this case here, I look at this con uh, concentration of, of whatever I'm looking at, the component. I have the component peak area, and it's divided by the component response factor. And you can find this on your formula sheet, page 12, and I think that Tyler's got that uh, into the uh, Blackboard as of last night. This one's on your formula sheet. So uh, these, these uh, if you're looking for a concentration, component peak area and component response factor is in the formula sheet. Okay, next one is, is uh, the component response factor. So what is the response factor from that analyzer? And it equals a component air peak area and, and a component known standard. So that's how we find out that response factor, how that, how that analyzer is responding to that individual component. And again, this known <clears throat> uh, co component known standard, again, is done in laboratories. So define the terminology using uh, chrom uh, chromatography. So here's, here's actually all the parts and pieces that we need for this analyzer. We have here the carrier gas, which is obviously my mobile phase. So it pushes through and it, it continues all this through the sample injector, through the column, through the detector, and all the way out and comes to a vent. The detector will obviously um, go to a chart recorder and, and give you your chromatogram. This sample injector, uh, your sample in, it pushes a sample in, and then it pushes your sample out. And uh, this is a valve. This is a valve that we'll be talking about, um, a sample injector valve. And we talk about that in about page 40 or something like that. And we talk, we show you how it works. So the types of uh, chromatography, the mobile phase listed first, stationary phase listed second. So, Gas chromatography is GC, and liquid chromatography is LC. No big deal there. When I go to the gas um, chromatography, I have different stationary phases. So gas liquid chromatography is GLC, and gas solid chromatography is GC, GSC. So this is just basically some identification. 
liquid liquid chromatography llc and liquid solid chromatography lsc okay retention time page 11. the time taken from the sample injection to the maximum detector signal for each sample component so here we have three. We have uh, we have uh, three different components. We have peak one, and then we get peak two, and then we get peak three. Uh, the the uh, from the the sample injection to the tip of the peak is the retention time. So in this case here, if I look at this, what is the retention time for the peak uh, on this chromatogram? What do you think the temp, the, the uh, retention time is? Roughly 68 seconds, 67 seconds. Yeah, exactly. So I look at that and TR is about 67 seconds. So again, this is really important because it's going to be plotted against a known standard that was done in the lab, right? So, and, and then we'll, we'll know what component this is. So retention time, and that's going to be uh, in one of your, uh, calculations. So, so when I, I found a group of compounds with similar chemical properties that, that vary with predict in a predictable way with a number of carbon atoms. So here we've got ethane, here we've got propane, and here we got butane. And we look at these boiling part points, right? Um, because if we boil off particular um, components of our sample, we may not get accurate readings. So th this here is, uh, when I look at the bottom here, this is the number of carbon, carbon number. So carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and then of course it's ethane, propane, and butane. So gas liquid chromatograph for homologist series is defined as a family of hydrocarbons which are straight chain alkanes. A little bit of chemistry from third year. Helium is generally used as carrier gas. And this is kind of important because uh, the reason helium is used is because it doesn't affect anything, any of the uh, detectors or anything like that. The carrier gas is, um, carrier gas is used mostly. And we'll talk a little bit about the carrier gas later. So the column used as straight alkanes must be heated but below the boiling point so the liquid phase does not vaporize and they just throw that in there just to give you an indication of how this works with uh, uh, alkanes so partitioning partitioning is talking about the actual sample itself well actual component of the sample uh, the individual component of the sample and and you can you might have i don't know 10 different components but this, the, the uh, sample itself, individual components, some will absorb in, uh, uh, in the um, solid or liquid stationary phase, and some will keep going. So that's called partitioning, because part of it's staying, part of it's going. And they were talking about this a little bit, because this is where you get uh, the peak starting. So some of it's coming through, and then the most of it's coming through at the peak, and then, then later on, on the, on the right hand side of the peak as, as the chromatic graph is being built comes out and then it's all gone but it does split and it's called partitioning and that's each component so volatility is the tendency of a substance to vaporize so in this case here at point a you can see that i've got volatility low boiling point so very little um very little of this component is absorbed into the liquid stationary phase so but this stuff keeps going now if i have <clears throat> volatile moves faster less volatile moves slower in this case i've got more of this component being adsorbed into the liquid stationary phase because it's less volatile and it has a higher boiling point and then the rest of this goes so you'll get a in this case here when you get your peak it'll be a, a shorter peak and a, and a fatter peak Carbon atoms and retention time. So um, this was ethane, propane, and butane. Again, you saw those as a three. Um, retention time, 
Uh, retention time is here is 120 seconds for ethane, propane's 240, and butane's 540, and those are all in seconds. Now, you notice we got a log on here. The reason we log the, to the 10th to the uh, time for retention time is that it gives us a linear uh, uh, chart. This does not give us a linear chart. And you know, as instrumentation techs, we like to be linear. So at the log 10, it's going to give us uh, a linear a linear chart. So when we talk, when we plot the retention time just on the actual retention time itself, it's nonlinear relationship. And then when we when we plot retention time on a log of the re, of the retention time, we get a linear relationship. So some mathematical whiz came up with that. And it's always nice to be linear. If we log the retention times, we get a linear plot. The log of the retention time is proportional to the carbon number, which is kind of interesting for us. Polarity. When we talk about polarity, we're talking about um, uh, unbalanced charged on a molecule. Like dissolves like applies to stationary phase in the column. So if, if I've got a uh, polarity like the polarity of my solid, it's going to dissolve. So it says like dissolves like. So if that component has a, almost the same polarity as my stationary phase, it's going to absorb quite a bit. So here's a, here's a chart from page 16. Well, this is 16 to 18. Uh, the nonpolar alkanes or methane is nonpolar. The least polar is benzene and blah, blah, blah. You don't have to remember all this stuff, but you have to understand that these are um, polarity sensitive to the analyzer that you're going to be using. So you have to know what kind of, uh, what, what kind of stationary phase you're going to use. So this shows you, A shows you um, methane nonpolar. Just means it doesn't have a positive and negative on the top and bottom. Uh, this does with, we have methyl chloride. Uh, you can see the negative with chlorine and the positive with the hydrogens. And then the most is going to be <clears throat> methanol, where I've got, I've got uh, my oxygen and then I've got my hydrogen in the bottom, so it's polar. And it's the most polar. So again, the reason we talk about this is so that um, we know what stationary phase to use and know what, what analyzer, what type of chromatic, chromatograph we're going to use to sample these. Okay, so now we get into this area and uh, measurement and concentration. And this is when we talk about that peak that's coming through from the detector. So integrating is when the chromatograph computes the peak area between the start and the end of the peak. So you're going to have a, a, a computer that's going to compute this for you. So when we look at this illustration, we can see when it starts, the peak starts. We can see the retention time because it's the tip of the peak. And then we can see the drop in signal and that detects the end of the peak. So this is important because we're going to figure out the area, peak area here at the center. <clears throat> when calibrating a chromatograph with known concentrations for each sample component, a response factor is calculated for that analyzer. Now what that means is that each analyzer isn't going to be exactly the same. So we need to fire through a sample, pure sample, and find out how that individual analyzer responds to uh, our components because each one's going to be a little bit different. So in this case here, I'm, I'm giving you an example, a calibration gas containing 90% uh, methane and 3% propane. That's all, that's all that's in it. This produces uh, 323,050 peak area units for the methane. And with this uh, chromatograph, it, it produces 78,923 peak area units for propane. 
what's response factor of the methane and the propane? Okay, so if we look at this, this is a um, component resp response factor for that individual analyzer. So you have component peak area divided by the percent of concentration. Now, unfortunately, you're going to have to know this one because this is one of these one-offs that's not in the formula sheet. So you might as well write this one down because the component response factor is equal to the component peak area divided by the concentration of the component. And that's going to give me my response factor because we are going to need that for my next calculation. So in order to write... Uh, to figure this out, um, you can you can actually do uh, the uh, calibration here with, uh, uh, say, for propane. What is my component response factor for propane? So I, what I do is I take my component peak area, and it gives me that there, and it tells me, and then it takes me my percentage. So I have three hundred and twenty-three and 50 units divided by 97 percent and that's going to give my uh basically going to give me my response factor for methane and i calculated out and i've got 3330.41 so if you've calculated that out and and you get 3330.41 um you've done it correct the next propane, the next uh, response factor is for propane, and I got a peak area of seventy-eight thousand nine hundred twenty-three, and it's divided by three percent because that is my component concentration. And there, there are uh, in your in your ILMs, there is a couple um, examples there that you can just walk through and and um, and figure them out yourself just to get a hold because you'll be asked a question on this for sure. And the reason we do this is because every analyzer is going to have a different response factor to a particular component. So we've got, uh, as I say, res response factor there, we've got uh, for methane is 3,330.41 and response factor for um, my propane is, is uh, 26,000. 307.67. So concentration, use a calculated response factor from the previous slide. Uh, I don't know if you written, wrote them down, but I'll, I'll have them here anyway, and I'll show you as we go through. So a sample containing methane and a propane is ran through a chromatograph and produces 283,050 peak units, uh, air units, and methane is 342,004 peak area units for propane. And then it's going to ask me what concentration of methane and propane are contained in the sample. So concentration, again, this one's on the formula sheet, so that's cool again. So you get the concentration equals component peak area divided by component response factor. So now that's going to be telling me my, my concentration. And again, that's on page 12 for the sheet. So what I do here is I know my peak area here because it's given to me. So the propane is, um, is going to be... Uh, oh, no, sorry, this is the methane. So chromatographin produces 283... 50 peak area units for methane. So I'll, I'll take that three, uh, 283 uh, and 50, put it here. And then my response factor, which was going to be here and, and it was on the page for, on the, on the last page, uh, response factor for methane was 3,330.41. So then that, I put 330.41 on here, and I got myself 84.99%. And then when I did propane, I had my propane peak area 
of uh, 342,004. Uh, and my propane response factor is 26,307.67. So then I just did my calculation down here on the concentration and I come up with 13%. So I look at this and I say, okay, well, I've got 84.99% of methane and I've got 13% of propane. Well, that doesn't add up to 100%. So the analyzer normalizes it. And this is page 20 where we're normalizing it. What it does is it bumps both uh, of the propane and the, and the methane to 100% because we know that that's all that's in there. We know that the, the uh, so we call this normalization or normalizing. If there are no missing components, the chromatograph can force a concentration to add up to 100%. Causes for differences uh, for this normalization are temperatures, sample size, all sorts of different things. But there is there is an issue there. So it normalizes it and makes it 100%. So it asks you here, did the total concentrations of methane and propane add up to 100? Well, the answer was no. And if not, calculate the normalization factor and multiply it to the concentration of the methane and propane to see it if the new total adds up to 100. And I did that calculation with normalization and it did work. So normalization factor is also on your formula sheet. It gives you 100% divided by the total percentage. And the total percentage uh, was something like 97.99. And you divide that by 100, then you multiply the number by uh, to the methane and the propane, and it, it puts you almost right at 100%. Kind of a, um, all it's doing is, it's just taking that sample and saying, okay, I know that there's 100% and the methane and the propane have to add up to 100%. And each individual analyzer is gonna be a bit different and it's almost like an error, right? Any questions with that? No, that's all good. Okay. So third, describe the components of a gas chromatograph. So here they are. So basically, number one, we have the, the carrier gas. So that's the bottle. Uh, we have the regulators uh, for carrier gas flow. One of the most important things here is, is uh, we can never not have gas flow. As a matter of fact, the uh, analyzer we have in our lab right now, um, there is gas flowing through it. There's a, there's a carrier gas flowing through it. When you guys do these um, uh, labs, uh, we're going to ask you what how how full the bottle is. So if it's um, if it's a situation where the bottle has less pressure than we want, it means we have less helium and means that we need to replace that bottle. So it's hugely important for the carrier gas flow to be constant because if it's not, um, your chromatograph will make, won't even make any sense. So uh, we got carrier gas, we got uh, carrier flow control. So there's, there's regulators here. Then we have our sample injector. Uh, we inject our sample in here. The carrier gas is flowing this way, goes into the column, right? Goes into the column, spends some time in the column, then goes to the detector. Um, and then this carrier gas waste is no big deal, but, but depending on what we're analyzing, we may have to vent our sample waste so somewhere that it, it will be safe. If you if you're in a in a um, a lab or you're in a building if you're in a, uh, and you have an analyzer and you're measuring I don't know hydrogen or whatever anything that's uh, that's uh, explosive um, you want that waste to be discarded safely 
or you may have a big bomb setting up in your in your shop or wherever you're doing it. Um, detector, yeah. So here I got my my millivolt, milliamp down through here. It was my chromatograph uh, detector signal. Um, one of the important things, and that's that's here, is oven temperature has to be constant too. So that gives me more normalization and all my errors and all that kind of stuff. If I don't have a constant temperature in my oven. Um, this type of uh, chromatograph can detect vaporized samples. Maintaining retention time and detector sensitivity by keeping the carrier gas flow constant. That's a huge thing for us. If, we're, if it, we, we, won't get, we won't get true uh, analysis through the, in the chromatograph if I don't. So carrier gas must be inert. When I say inert, it does not react with the sample or the stationary phase. It's all by, all by itself. And helium is, is usually the number one uh, carrier gas. The carrier gas must allow maximum de detector response. We talked about the detector response. Uh, they must be high purity, no contaminations. And this one here is, is pretty important, especially when we get into the, uh, um, into the detectors. Hydrogen is used because it has the highest thermal conductivity, but it can explode if it leaks into the oven and mixes with oxygen. So it does have the highest thermal conductivity, but it's not used very often uh, because simply because <laughs> it's dangerous, where helium is not. Helium won't explode. But if you want the best readings, all that kind of stuff, hydrogen has the best because it has the th highest thermal conductivity. And when we get into our detectors, I'll show you why uh, that we need something with a high thermal conductivity. Okay, here's a here's, uh, uh, couple of gas cylinders. Have a look at that. Um, this is basically for backup redundancy. Which uh, of the cylinder gases would empty first? So I've got these two cylinders, and I can't I can't afford not to have my carrier gas being consistent and and uh, at the right flow. So which which regulator which which cylinder would fill out first or would empty out first? Probably the 80, 80 psi because it's higher pressure, so it's got more flow. Yeah, in this case here, um, if every all the valves are open, right? I've got 80, 80 pressure on uh, 80 psi on cylinder two. Well, the 70 psi on cylinder one can't go anywhere because of the higher pressure of cylinder of cylinder two. So you're right. Cylinder two would be used up first. As soon as that's used up, then we would get um, cylinder one to start um, providing our carrier gas. Makes sense, right? The higher set regulator pressure does not let the lower set reg, uh, regulator pressure flow. So carrier glass flow control. This is from the manifold. You have a carrier pressure adjustment here. You have a pressure gauge, carrier flow restriction valve, and then the, to the sample injector. And this is all held into a constant oven temperature. So you always get the same flow. Constant flow rate of carrier gas is essential for proper retention time. Man, that's come up lots. I, I think that'd be definitely a, a test question. Cylinder manifold pressure should be at least 10 PSI over the instrument regulator for stable control. So the pressure here has to be 10 uh, PSI over the pressure that these are letting out. So this rotary valve, this is where my sample injection happens. Um, and there's a couple different types of rotary valve. I'm showing you this now it doesn't make a lot of sense but if i go if in a couple, couple slides, slides i'll show you how it actually works it's got six ports and it rotates and and uh, basically it traps sample and the carrier gas keeps flowing and then it um then it switches and whatever is is contained uh as far as my sample in this valve then is pushed into the column so when i when i looking at this um 
the description I gave you is easier in the next couple of slides to see what's going on. But for these valves, for the sample injection, we have a rotary valve. Chromatic, chromatic graphic valves are used to inject different flows with multiple columns. Here it is right here. So it shows you that. In this case, this is set A. So the sample comes in. It goes through the valve, the rotary valve goes through a little. This is this is not a column, but this is just a basically uh, the tubing. It goes through here and then samples out. So sample in, sample out, nothing's happening. Then when it switches over to B, you can see the this, this sample gas comes in and out. Well, here now all of this is trapped in there, right? So the carrier gas goes through four, valve four, three, and then push it back all the way through to the column. And it will do that because it do, we don't want continual sample going through. We want a set amount of sample, and we want to uh, determine when it does go through and when it, when it uh, basically vents. So in this case here, in A, what we're doing is we're actually, the sample's coming in and getting trapped right in here between six and three. Then when we switch the, the, the valve, uh, one goes to two and the sample just goes out, but the carrier gas goes from four, three, all the way through what has been caught and then pushed into the column. So again, it says these allow conditioned samples to keep flowing, it ejects a contained volume into the sample loop. So, we can always always use a sliding plate valve too. This is the same same kind of idea, but it's this is the different type of valve. It's a sliding gate. And then this one's a diaphragm valve. Uh, on A, you can see that uh, if we look at this, if I show you this uh, from A, the sample comes in, goes around like this, and then it goes out. The carrier gas is always flowing. It always flows. Then I go to B where it switches. So the sample gas comes in, goes out to vent. The carrier gas goes in here and takes all that sample that's in that loop, the sample loop, and pushes it to the column. Um, you can see the black says is equal to plunger depressed. So it seals it and then zero is plunger release. So again, it's just a diaphragm valve and it's in the sample system and it controls the amount of sample we get because the, the sample loop's filled and it pushes it to the column. <clears throat> columns, now these uh, columns are um, what we use to determine um, the components of our sample. So here we got columns and gas chromatic, uh, chromatography and we have gas liquid chromatography. We have packed columns. We have capillary columns with the liquid phase. And the solid phase, we have active solid packing and synthetic packing. So those are the types of columns that we have. So when we look at packed column and liquid phase, um, this is on page 33, uh, the molecules are absorbed or dissolved in the stationary phase. Of course, the word uh, also tells us uh, it's an ancient tubing here. So here's a carrier gas, and here's your sample going through here. And as it goes through here like this, the actual the actual molecules will, will absorb in the liquid phase. So the molecules will absorb in liquid phase. If they have an affinity, they'll stay longer. If there's no affinity, they'll push through. So that's our packed column. Next column is capillary column. Molecules absorb or dissolve into stationary phase, very small diameter tubing. Again, it's probably one eighth or even maybe smaller. So this case here, our sample's in here and it, it, uh, does, it absorbs here and then stays in there for a while and then it's eluded or some don't absorb at all. They just continue to going through. So they're just showing you that this is the, the molecular path going through this thin, thin capillary. And we have that absorption and elution happening there. And then this will go to this part of it 
will go to the detector and then we'll get a chromatograph out of it. This was active solid column. So it's a solid phase, everything's solid. Um, use of adsorption, which makes the molecule stick to the outer surface of the, of the solid packings. So here it shows you on the bottom here, it shows it's being adsorbed and then it releases. So if it has a high affinity, it's going to be adsorb a lot. If it has a low affinity, it just keeps going. So again, it just goes all through all this path here um, with these with this active uh, solid column. And then you get your um, separation through here, all of these columns, and it goes to the detector. So resolution measures how far apart the two sample peaks are separated by retention time. So there, we're talking now about the chromatograph and we're talking about the peaks that it's actually uh, making or sending out chromatograph. Um, what they're talking about here is that if the peaks are too close together, we can't get an accurate reading of the area of the peak because when one peak ends, the other peak starts and that they're too close together, you can't get that definite start and definite stop. So you, you're, you're calculating it out then. And I'll show you how that works. So two adjacent peaks should not overlap. So when I look at this, um, the resolution is retention time difference between the two sample peaks. So the resolution here is between the, the between here, the peak and here. So that's my S. So well, all they're saying is that this peak shouldn't overlap this peak and that peak shouldn't overlap that peak. Because if it does, then you're not going to get a, an accurate. So in this case here, my S is um, 21 seconds. And S is, is basically uh, the retention time B minus retention time A. The WA, so it's a width of A is 10 seconds, the width of B is 16 seconds, and the width average is 13 seconds. So my resolution is S divided by the width average. In this case, 21 seconds divided by 13 seconds is equal to 1.6 seconds. So that's my resolution is 1.6 seconds. Now, why is this important? Because if you have uh, resolution that's less than that, you are going to be estimating and not ac accurately measuring. So here's a case um, uh, of the chromatograph. It's got R3 is equal to 3. Uh, resolution is here is equal to 3. Resolution here is equal to 1. And resolution here is less than 1. So you can see where this peak st starts to end here. We know that it's going to go down here like this. And this first peak, we know that it's probably started over here, but we're just guessing, right? So a res resolution of one and above can have their areas accurately determined. If the resolution is less than one, the width of the different peaks overlap, and only an estimated area can be determined. So those are resolutions on page 36. Moving on, factors that affect revolution is type of column, temperature, and carrier gas flow rate. So those, these three things, well, these two actually, the type of column, I guess, yeah, is important too. So when we're, when we're looking at a chromatograph, these are the things we need to look at for a particular substance that we're, uh, mixture that we're analyzing. Peak resolution decreases when peak separation decreases and peak width increase. So that's just a statement that says that shows you this here. Okay, column efficiencies. Now the column is is what we talked about, the pack column, the capillary column, all those, that column. Um, each one has a different efficiency. And it's like the Reynolds number. There's sort of uh, uh, just a number uh, determined to uh, indicate how efficient the the actual columns are. So 
when we have a capillary column here, we have an N. So N is number equals 1,000 to 4,000, and that's plates per meter. So with that, we have higher co column efficiency, so we have a bigger peaks, or, or narrower peaks, sorry, not bigger, narrower. When I have a pack column, the efficiency of a pack column isn't the same as the capillary. We have N is equal to 500 to 1,000, and then we get a broader peak, right? So we're talking about column efficiency, and we're giving it like a Reynolds number, but it's, it's you know, it's um, theoretical. A column's ability to separate mixtures and generate chromatographs, chromatograms that have very small, narrow peak widths are considered high efficiency. And that makes sense too, because um, they stay in there longer than this, and this is willy nilly flow all the way through. Uh, this has a, a better, um, basically, efficiency. The number of theoretical plates is used to compare efficiency. So that's your N number. N is equal to the number of theoretical plates. Molecules take one path only in the capillary column, so N is higher. And as I say, these ones, these, these don't in the, in the pack column, the pack column, they're all over. So my N number is lower. It's less efficient. Molecules take more than one path in a pack column, so N is lower. All right, we're going to get into the columns now. Once we get into the columns, some of them are very um, fragile, let's put it. Um, they can't take large carbon numbers or anything, or they plug up like a capillary tube, might just plug right off. Or uh, So we have to do some things called flushing. Um, we don't want certain components of our um, known mixture to go through our analyzing or analysis column because they plug it off. And if you've got a plug column, uh, it's expensive to fix. Most likely you replace the column and they're expensive. So this is this uh, next few slides are talking about flushing or the way the uh, mixture goes through to the analysis column. So the first one is back flushing and we're talking about the columns here. Used to either speed up analysis time or prevent components that may clog the analysis column from entering. So step one, we've got, we've got our helium. We've got our helium coming through uh, constantly. We use a pre-cut column. So this pre-cut column is going to take out all the high number of carbons, all the big molecules that we don't want to go in here and plug this off. So we call this pre-cut. So this is step one. So I got the helium. I inject my sample here on this side. Two. Oh, well, there's my sample loop. So the helium takes the sample loop, puts it in here. So I've got here um, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5. Obviously, these flow uh, um, slower also with the carrier gas. So now this is what we've got. We've got in our pre-cut column, we've got our carbon fours and our carbon fives. And what we're trying to analyze in the analyst column is C1, C2, C3. <coughs> So what we do here is called back flushing. So step three is going to the helium, the carrier gas, switches over to the analysis column and starts pushing this way. So it pushes this way, pushes the, the carbon one, two, and three out over here, and then back flushes the pre-cut column. This is the pre-cut. Back flushes that. It does send it to the detector because the detector doesn't care. It, it doesn't. It, it's not. It's not as um, uh, delicate as, as the analysis column. So it goes through the detector anyway. So you get a chromatograph out of it, and that chromatograph looks like this. So my C4s plus come out first because they're being pushed out now. They're being pushed back out through, so they're out first. Now, this retention time means nothing because we're just wasting that. But these retention times do mean something. So the C1, the C2, and C3. This is why, this is why this is called a back flushing. 
uh, weighted to uh, for our columns. So the C4 and C5, carbon four and five, never get into this analysis column to plug it off. This next one, oh, back is the most common system used um, to reduce cycle time. Heart cut, a little bit different, separates a trace components of interest from another component that, el that eludes at approximately the same time from the analysis column. So we are heart cutting, we're taking just a specific interest, component of interest out. And I'll show you how this is done. So again, here's my pre-cut, here's my helium carrier gas flowing all the time, and then I've got a heart cut. So my helium comes through here, pushes what I'm uh, the component of interest through here and to the detector. So this is step one. Step two, the helium takes through the sample loop. Again, we're going to use the carbons, and I've got C5, C, uh, carbon four, carbon five, three, two. I have some H2S in here, and I have some uh, C1. So basically, this is pushing out and pushing to vent. So it's pushing C1 out to vent, and it, but it's keeping these, and I'll show you how it does that. So helium comes in through, through this and pushes out the pre-cut column. The analysis column is captured here. So I got, I got C2 and C3 and H2S coming out. Uh, the C1 here, carbon one has already been vented. So now this goes to the, now this goes to the vent detector to the vent. So now we're looking for H2S and C2. That goes to the detector, then the vent. So the chromatograph would look like this, C2 and H2S. So those, that's called hard cut, and I'm picking out what I wanted to pick out. So it separates the trace components of interest, because the other ones, uh, the C4, C5s, I'm not interested in. I'm interested in the C2 and the H2S, so that's how they do that, and it's called the hard cut. The next one is called the trap and hold. Now, it provides convenient timing of elution of sample components. So in this case here, I've got my helium carrier gas, i got my pre-cut column, my analysis column, trap and hold column, and then it goes to the detector. So helium through the sample loop, it starts pushing, well, it pushes all this. I got, again, C1, I got I, C1, C2, C3, C4, C5. So what happens here is the helium is put into the analysis column, push through. I have uh, C1, carbon one and I pushing through here. And that back, well, it doesn't back flush, but it pushes this all through. So that goes through your detector first. So this is trapping and holding this for now. Helium comes through here, pushes C3 and C2 down through here. It stops here, so this never went anywhere. Goes through, back through the pre-cut and goes to the detector. And the chromatograph would, and then the helium goes through the analysis column again, pushes the C1, CO2, or CO and N2 through, and it goes, this has already been flushed, goes to the detector, and there's my chromatograph. So this was called the trap and hold. The trap and hold is the one that's, that we, we, uh, they're going to use to uh, trap and hold a, a specific or, or component of interest. So those are all the ones we have for the columns. Um, one of the things they talk about is if you want a parallel system, uh, this this would be for high, high accuracy. It uses two separate configurations in parallel. So each configuration is optimized for different components for the sample. So you can have a hard cut used with the parallel, with trap and hold, whatever, you can use them. But the back flush is the most common. That's the one probably that we would use the most. Now, uh, valve switching back flush, again, it just shows you here on 4243 how it works. Um, I'm not going to go into it. You can just follow through the, this uh, uh, 
the, the three different combinations of when it happens and um, you know when the valve and when it vents and when you're going through the column. Uh, I'll leave that to you just to have a look at. Uh, controller valve switching again, it's done by controllers. A chromatograph controller control timings of each valve. Chromatographs valves are typically switched with air pressure. And controllers contain electronic components needed to control the gas chromatograph. Nothing new here. This is just your controller. Um, it's got a it's got a keyboard and operator interface, all that kind of stuff. I mean, every one of them has that. We have that in our labs too. Um, where is this? This is Hodgkinson's Incorporated. It, it doesn't matter which one we use. They all have the controllers. So chromatograph controller controls sampling injection switching, controls a column switching, it, it, it controls a detector signal processing, uh, peak and uh, area concentration, response factor and calibration, uh, data communication. So it does all that. <clears throat> uh, then it jumps to uh, constant oven temperature Again, all it's doing is it's got this return. It's got an aspirator pump, and it's it's basically just making sure that there's flow return air and stuff, so that this whole uh, oven stays at a comp constant temperature. So it's just emphasizing how important it is really to keep that uh, chromatograph oven at a constant temperature using an aspirator pump. <laughs> Temperatures of uh, changes may affect the following sample vaporization, retention times, carrier gas flow, retention times, and detector output peak area. So if if we don't keep all of these constant, uh, we're going to get some erratic chromatographs that uh, don't mean anything to us. Temperature in controlled in the oven to be within plus or minus 0 0.3 degrees C. That's not a lot. That's not a lot of leeway there for sure. All right. The next one. This is our last objective. And for you electricians, this is going to be easy because we're talking about um, resistance and, and conductance, um, universal detectors, respond to physical change in carrier gas due to the presence of other type of molecules. Specific detectors respond to presence of specific molecules. Uh, you got a TCD, thermal conductivity. So this is uh, where it responds to change of thermal conductivity of a carrier gas. This is the most common um, universal detector. And I'm gonna talk about each one of them individually. Um, thermal conductivity, if you're, uh, if your element gets hotter, we get higher resistance. If it's colder, we get lower resistance. And that's how this thermal conductivity works. Flame ionization detectors uh, response to electrical current due to the change of ions and molecules are burned. Um, this is the most common specific detector. You got a flame photometric um, detector response to sulfur compounds. It actually burns them. How much it burns determines how much um, um, current's going to flow. And then photoionization detector responds to aromatic carb compounds. So that's a specific detector, and we'll talk about each one of these, and then we're done. So thermal conductivity detector. So if you look at it, I've got a resistor in there, uh, some sort of filament. Uh, on the left-hand side is the sample filament. And on the right-hand side is the reference filament. So when I look at this, uh, my sample is going to go through in here. Obviously, my sample has carrier gas. So it has carrier gas in the sample. So this is going to get way hotter than this one is, which has pure carrier gas. So this is my reference. So the difference between the current flowing through here and the current flowing through here is going to uh, measure the amount of com components I have in there. And obviously, the, the, um, the retention time, they come in at different times at different compounds, or different components, I should say. 
So this is a universal detector. It's the most common, measures down to parts per million range. Um, also, we talk about this th highest thermal conductivity, and this is where I was saying this hydrogen um, is the best because it, it'll give you most accurate reading. But helium is second. Uh, when other gases are mixed with a carrier gas, the thermal conductivity is reduced. The sample filament will increase in resistance, causing less current to flow. Causing less current to flow gives me uh, parts per million range. Pretty straightforward on that. This one is the Wheatstone Bridge. Um, very important to us. We use a Wheatstone Bridge a lot of uh, in, a, in a lot of applications, but in this case, we're using it for again. It's changing in resistance. We've got uh, carrier gas from the column right here. So pure carrier gas going through here. No, sorry, that's from the column. So that's it's got carrier gas and it's got the mixture. This one's a pure carrier gas. So again, the difference between temperature here and the temperature here is going to give us current flow or vol uh, voltage, output voltage, and it determines parts per billion, I think, on this one. Produces an output voltage proportional to the difference in resistance between RS, which is your sample, and RF, which is your reference. So my RF, pure carrier gas, and this is from the column, so that's the sample. So the difference between the heat or the heat here the output voltage and the output voltage or the heat, basically what it does on, on these, it either increases or decreases the resistance. So then you have a voltage change here. To protect the, the uh, these TDC filaments, make sure the power is off and let the carrier gas cool the filaments first. So that's, that's, that's going to be a test question because it's important if you're using these TDCs and you don't cool them, they'll burn out. Flame ionization detector, it's kind of cool. Here's your, your carrier gas from the column. So there's your carrier gas in your mixture going up through here. You got your hydrogen, that's just basically for your, for your flame. Keeps this flame, H2 air flame, keeps it going and so depending on how many compounds you have or what's burning here, current flow proportion to the mass of ionized sample. So when this burns, it ionizes, and then the current flow is proportional to what's in the sample. That's a specific detector. It measures organic concentrations down to parts per billion range. Uh, the next one is a flame uh, photometric detector. Um, it works on the size, the light emitted, the size of the rays of the light emits. And then there's a photo, photo multiplier tube, and this is, gives you, just gives you your output. And the output is to light intensity. So what happens here is my carrier gas flows through here from the column. So there's my sample. I got sulfur compounds coming in. I have hydrogen, which is going to maintain my flame. So uh, H2 air flame. And I have some air. We have to have air in here to keep it burning. Emitted light from sulfur. So we have uh, the light that it's emitted from the burnt sulfur. It goes through this light filter and it tells you how much sulfur is in that sample. A specific uh, parts per billion for sulfur and phosphorus compounds. The last one is a photoionization detector. And basically, it's a specific detector, very sensitive parts per billion for aromatic molecules such as benzene and toluene. So again, uh, you get the carrier gas, you have high electrodes, and you have a UV lamp. When they burn, this UV lamp gives off, or it gives, it gives uh, off some light. You got a UV lamp power supply and it determines how much is in your sample gas through these, this right here is your positive and this is your negative. So how much current flow goes through here 
uh, is determined determining your aromatic molecules or how much concentration of them. So in summary, gas chromatographs are used to measuring many different homogeneous in the gas mixtures. A chromatograph will be designed to and configured specific to the sample it will be measuring so it can perform both a qualitative and a quantitative analysis. And again, here's your questions on, on page 54. So I'll stop share and, and show, I'll go back to my share camera. And I noticed that I didn't get any questions and I noticed that everybody stays here. <laughs> so that was, that was long. Um, uh, and there's tons of information there, but I, I narrowed it down as best I could for you. Uh, have a look, uh, go through your self test and, um, have, if you have any questions, just text me, email me or email me, I should say, and I'll be glad to help. So I'm going to stop recording and we're good to go. I'll stick here All for right, a bit. Tim, thanks a lot. eh? Okay, man. No problem. Um, again, this is being recorded. So if, if you've missed something, uh, do you think you want to go over or whatever? Um, have a look. There's calculations that are, uh, are on page. Let me see here. The peak areas and things like that. Uh, go through them, make sure you can do them. Your response factors and concentrations and stuff like that. Um, just go through those because you'll probably get one of those on an exam. And as I say, the only, the only thing um, that's not on your formula sheet, because I was looking at my formula sheet on page 12. It's got concentration, component peak area over component fa response factor, and it has normalization factor, but it does not have the calculation for the response factor, which is in your book. So that'll be one of these uh, commit to memories is how to do the response factor. And it's really component area, peak area over concentration. All right. If you have no more, if you have questions, just email them to me. Uh, have a great weekend, and um, um, I think my next lecture is Tuesday, Tuesday, and it's going to be chromatograph part B. So Tuesday at nine o'clock, I'll be in. Okay, man. Have a great weekend. Yeah, have a great weekend, guys. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Do that.